55 years ago, the world met Mary Poppins. It's super califragilistic, expialidocious, even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. Good girl. Today, this is Julie Andrews at home. So much life in her smile, in her arm around your shoulders, and in all the joy she has given us for generations. It started 56 years ago when a stage actress boarded a flight to Hollywood to make her very first movie ever. And no idea what movie stars do. Ah, what, how do I say that? What do I do? You're age 27. Do you remember the first exchange of the first movie that you ever did in your life? You mean the first take? In Mary Poppins, yes. Yeah, I do. Uh, Dick Van Dyke said, Mary Poppins, you look beautiful. And all I had to do was walk across the camera and say, do you, do you really, really think, think so? so? Cross me, aren't you do? And so it began. And it wasn't how she said it. It was that something in her face told you. There was someone named Mary Poppins who wanted to heal your world and make it bright. By the way, she invented those feet. The feet need to be turned out. Why? I don't know, but you don't want droopy feet at the end of the image of the umbrella. And early on, she showed she could do anything. A robin feathering. Do you need a tweeting robin? You're doing that whistling? <clears throat> yeah, I was very good at whistling. For a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Every scene, a kind of decathlon, singing, tweeting, and a huge contraption. Yeah, there was a, a wire that went up my shoulder and down my back. Every scene had to be perfect. Some of them taking six weeks of rehearsal. Watch her and Dick Van Dyke from behind the scenes, trying to balance on anvils that will eventually become turtles. I was learning on my feet, Diane, I mean, so fast. The costume designer, who also happened to be her husband, Tony Walton, created a kind of message. He had secrets in the costume. Yes. He said, I fancy that um, Mary Poppins has a secret life, a uh, kind of quiet pleasure at being a little wicked and uh, naughty. Underneath all the skirts, there were other colors. And so when I kicked up my heels or when I moved, you just caught a flash. The movie was the dream of Walt Disney, who had handpicked the young stage actress. Happy ever after, after she performed Camelot on The Ed Sullivan Show and he went to see her on stage. Someone comes to see you who has <laughs> a life-changing idea. I heard that Walt Disney was out front and had requested, please, to come and say hello after the show. He came back and mentioned this live-action animation film that he was hoping to make of P.L. Travers' Mary Poppins. And I said, oh, Mr. Disney, I would, I'd be thrilled. I'd never made a movie. And he was so sweet and charming and twinkly and lovely. I said, but I can't, I'm pregnant. And he said, oh, that's okay, we'll wait. <laughs> the stern, formidable P.L. Travers, who had created Mary Poppins, even phoned her the day after her baby was born. And she said, well, talk to me. I gather you're going to be doing Mary Poppins. And I said, well, um, I, I, I've just had a baby and I'm feeling a bit groggy right now, Miss Travers, but how lovely to talk to you. And uh, she said, well, you're far too pretty, of course, but you've got the nose for it. That, I guess. <laughs> My ski nose. It's all here in her new memoir, Home Work, the story of a life lived in the place where home and work are in collision. A life that had begun with a little girl endlessly traveling through music halls in vaudeville. The loneliness of a young girl with a startling talent, here singing for the King of England. She was doing it all to help support her unsteady, cracked family. You grew up in a turbulent household of alcoholism, anger, mm -hmm. uncertainty. And despair on my mum's part and things Depression. like that. Depression. Yeah. She promised her mother somehow she would make it all right. As a teenager, she bought the family home. 
but through it all, a supernatural gift and an escape from the sorrows in her life. And it was like four or five octaves, and I could, you know, dogs for miles around would howl when I went way, way up into the stratosphere. F above high C. F above high C was twice nightly at, in my debut, yeah. You've talked about the fact that you were taught just to carry the note and keep and the note. And to even them all even like them. a string of pearls, if possible. Just pure joy. In her book, she writes about being Maria von Trapp in The Sound of Music. Isn't it pretty? I think this was actually my favorite location. Five years ago, we took her to that treasured place, Salzburg, Austria. I went in search of her famous mountain. So here's what we've heard. It's out of town that you can't find it on any Google map, so don't even bother trying. So here we go. A little mud. It's OK. Wow, is this it? Is this it? Here we are, the view, exactly as it was a half a century ago. So I went to your mountain. I want to know how you did that. How I got up there? Oh, well, my we actually went up the mountain in big open carts pulled by oxen. I would sit on top of all the camera equipment, and then they'd hoist me up, and up we'd go. Back in 1965, Julie Andrews was doing battle with a helicopter that kept blowing up a tornado of wind. This giant helicopter came at me sideways with a very brave cameraman hanging out the side where the door would be normally. But every time he went around me, the downdraft from the jets would fling me down into the grass. Those what stories. a trip we had. Didn't we? Oh. I loved that time. It was so great. And a new detail from the new book, the one lyric that still baffles her. You still don't know what it means, a lark who is learning to pray. <laughs> it's not easy uh, to <laughs> sing through the night like a lark, lark who is learning to pray. I don't think larks sing at night. Have you ever seen a lark praying? <laughs> I, <laughs> I haven't. So I actually what I did was decide that I'd coast over the words as quickly as I could. So to sing through the night like a lark who is learning to pray, I <laughs> go to the hills. <laughs> like a lark who is Enough about that. Yes, and move um, right on, yes. <laughs> and the joy of that music would propel her through movie after movie, albums, concerts, a golden career, and a struggle at home. You write so movingly about this melancholy that descends on you sometimes and the depression and trying to understand it and going to the psychoanalyst. I finally got enough courage after the first week to say, I don't understand why I'm weeping so much, I can't seem to stop. You know, you're surrounded by the wagons and suddenly the cavalry comes up over the hill in one of those westerns and you weep for relief. Well, your whole life had been geared toward a sort of perfectionism. Because... Yes, well, those lovely first movies were no help either. But <laughs> no. <laughs> Mary Poppins practically perfect in every way. And she wasn't, so there you are. She writes of one song and singing a note designed to carry everyone closer to their happy ending. The song was Jingle Bells. I didn't feel it coming. Go out, further out. And up next, she and her daughter Emma will tell us what we've never heard before. I don't know, and this is not hopefully Pollyanna-ish, but if it is, what would you expect from Mary Poppins' <laughs> daughter? Um, I don't know a more resilient person. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.